All right, so we're starting with the, probably the most read chapter in the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And uh, if you're here this morning, then you know that the, the content or the subject matter, I should say, of the sermon for this evening, uh, I titled my sermon, Drug Use in Light of the Bible. So if you weren't here this morning, I think most of you were, if you weren't here this morning, um, it is important. It's, it's almost like a two-part sermon where I preached on alcohol and and. Uh, you know, the science and the Bible and how it talks about alcohol. And there is definitely a lot of overlap when we talk about drug use. And, and you know, I was thinking back, I don't know if I've ever preached an entire sermon just about drug use in the scripture. And there is a lot to cover in the Bible, believe it or not. While it doesn't say any, it doesn't use the word drug it still has plenty of principles and truths that I think we could very easily apply as to why drug use in general should be avoided and not used and can even be deemed sinful. Um, but there, there's a lot, of, a lot of subject matter to cover, so I'm going to try my best to cover as much as possible because when I'm talking about drugs, Probably the most, the, the first thing that might pop in your mind is illicit drugs or illegal drugs. And those are definitely on my list of things I'm going to be covering. And depending on where you live in the country, you know, marijuana may or may not be included in that list. But I'm covering marijuana today because regardless of the legality of marijuana, it's still a drug and it's still a sin for Christians to be smoking pot. Okay. Now, whether or not it should be legal, that's a topic for another day. It really has nothing to do with my sermon. Uh, I don't think it should be illegal, but that's that. like I said, that's neither here nor there. We're going to look at, the, at whether or not things are sinful and what we should be doing as believers, whether something is legal or not illegal. Uh, marijuana, heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, LSD, uh, magic mushrooms, psilocybin, DMT, and... Prescription drugs, narcotics, other things. Okay, there, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Again, the legality shouldn't really matter. We should be looking to Scripture to determine what's right and what's wrong. And the way I'm going to approach this, I'm going to answer a couple of things that I've seen. Some are going to be more geared towards specific drugs than others. Okay, so we're starting off with some people that might make the claim about drugs and say, but it's natural. God made it. Now, obviously, some of the drugs in that list are not natural. They're synthetic. They're made by mankind. So that wouldn't apply to this argument. But the number one and probably the one I might focus on the most would be marijuana, just because it seems to be the most common, the most popular, just like alcohol this morning is extremely uh, popular and that deserves its own sermon in itself. But many of the arguments that you can use about being drunken would also apply to being high, okay, being in an altered state, whether that's induced by the poison of alcohol or by the poison that comes from some plant or some derivative of a plant, right? Like cocaine comes from the coca leaves. So it still comes from a plant. It's derived from that. And it, so, so what, right? If that's what's causing you to be inebriated or to be intoxicated and you use some other poison that gives you some other type of experience, it's, it can still, I believe, all be encompassed in drunkenness. So what I preached this morning about drunkenness, about alcohol, at least some of it, would be all applicable. I'm just going to sweep that with a broad brush and say, yeah, go ahead and consider that and consider drugs when we're looking at what the Bible teaches about drunkenness. But let's answer some of these objections and, and see, uh, you know, get a little bit of, of wisdom from Scripture here. The person who's going to say it's natural and specifically the marijuana, but you could apply this to mushrooms maybe and some other things. But the Bible, we, we started there reading in Genesis chapter 1. And, I, I mean, you may or may not believe this. You probably do because our world's crazy anyways, but... People will turn to these verses that, I'm, that we're going to look at this morning as a justification for why it's okay to smoke pot. 
Genesis 1, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. And for potheads, and, and look, the, look, here's some truth, and some of you may not know this. And, and you know, it's, God bless you if you don't know this. But when people get into drugs, oftentimes they get all about the drug. Like it's a big part of their life. Okay, and, and at this point I'm going to refrain from admitting some more of my faults as thoroughly as I did this morning with the alcohol. Okay, but I'll just let it be known because it's not a full secret that I've had my own experiences and, and my own sinfulness in these areas as well. Okay, so... Uh, which shouldn't matter, but y you can't pull one over on me and say, oh, well, that's not really the way it is. I know how it is, okay? Whether by my experience or through experience of friends and people I've been around and, and the, the, the wicked lifestyle I used to be part of. So when it comes to things like drugs, people do get all into this stuff. That's why, I mean, you'll see people who have posters of pot leaves up on their wall and they'll have like, they do doodling and drawings and all this stuff about, about whatever drug they're into. It becomes like, like at the forefront of their mind in so many things. And if you've, again, not, not endorsing it, if you've seen any of the movies that kind of parody or make fun of people who smoke pot, you know what I'm talking about. And the reason why it's in the movie is because it's a real thing. Because people say a lot of stupid things and do a lot of stupid things and get focused on a lot of stupid things. Hey, man, have you ever seen a dollar bill when you fold it together? You know, it's like <laughs> stupid stuff. Stupidity. And, and, and literally stupid because when you do the drugs, just like alcohol, if you remember when I was preaching about alcohol this morning, the cognitive skills, it dumbs you down so much that when you're doing the drugs, you think stupid things are really profound. But you're really just dumb. Yeah. In that instance, you, you are just much dumber than you were before you took the drug. But all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I understand life, man. I understand the world, man. Can you believe how deep this is? And you're really just getting a really stupid understanding of things. Conversation that I don't know if I was a part of, I heard, whatever, was, was the, this great observation when someone was high on marijuana going, hey, who here is familiar with the game of life? You ever play the game of life, board game, right? Board game, most people, right, know what I'm talking about? Okay, and I know there's a new version of it. We played the old version of it that had revenge. It was way better than the new version of it. I don't know why they decided to, the, to destroy that game with, with I mean, you could play the stocks and do all kinds of other stuff, stuff in the game of life the way it used to be. Anyways, neither here nor there. The board game had like all these little pieces and you have little houses and, and little college, you, you know, it kind of looks like it. And, and this is just an example of how stupid it is when people talk about things. It's like, oh, our life, it's like a game. It's like the game of life. It's like, no, the game of life is supposed to be like life. Our life isn't like the game of life, stupid. But this is the profound thought, like, it's all like a game. Look at that, because uh, your, your perceptions change. Look at the building over there. It's just like a game piece. <laughs> and it's some profound thought, like, dummy, they made the game piece after the building. <laughs> like, it's not profound. It's stupid. And we're just, we're just playing this game, and we're driving this, you know. It's dumb. Okay, it's dumb. But for the people in the moment, you have this feeling like you're understanding so much, okay, it's a chemically induced feeling that you're getting, but your cognitive skills have gone down. It, it, I, I guess it's probably similar to the, you know, that phrase, ignorance is bliss. You kind of become more ignorant, and you just can't understand things as well, and it's, it, I guess it's bliss. I don't know, but Th these are the types of things, and, and why am I even mentioning this? Why am I bringing this? Why am I bringing up some of these effects? 
Ask yourself, is that how God would have you to be living? As an idiot. Saying stupid things. Now, when people are just ignorant, and especially as they're younger and they're growing and they're learning things, fine. You don't understand some things. You have to grow. You have to learn. That's not wrong or wicked. But when you're already at the point where you should know these things, or you already do know them, and then you kind of revert back because you're putting some substance in your body and making yourself a fool and making yourself like an idiot, God's not pleased with that. That's not a good testimony. People make the claim, well, God made it. God made every herb bearing seed. And this is where I got off on the tangent anyways. Other people going like, see, look, it says herb. See, look, it says seed. You think that's just talking about marijuana? No. When all you think about and all you see is marijuana, you're going to see it everywhere. But no. An herb is a plant. Right? And, and when you keep reading, it says, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, and which is a fruit of, uh, of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Meat is like your food. No one's out there eating marijuana for their food. Like, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, I'm just going to cut down this, this pot plant and I'm going to eat it. And like, no. No one was doing that then, and they're not doing it now. There's one reason why people ingest it, and it's not to, to satisfy the munchies. Okay? It's not what it's for. But people will look at this and say, and say see, look, God... If God made it, then it's good. And, and you could see in Genesis 1 here, uh, verse number 30, and to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and everything that creepeth on the burning earth where there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And evening and the morning were the sixth day. This is Genesis chapter 1 before sin. Everything God made in the beginning was very good. And it was the way he intended on it. But did things change or did they stay the same as exactly as it was in the Garden of Eden? Uh, no, they changed, right? The creation changed after Adam and Eve sinned. Look at chapter 3, verse number 17. Because even if you want to say, well, God made this plant, is the plant really that bad? Well, for human consumption, yes. God made all the plants. But they're not all to be eaten. They're not all to be smoked. In fact, none of them should be smoked. They have plenty of other uses. Some of them you eat. They're called vegetables. Yes, eat your vegetables. That's a good thing. Look at verse 17 in Genesis chapter 3. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. This was not a part of the original creation. God made it all good and easier, and it wasn't going to be that difficult for Adam to provide for his household, but because he sinned, now the ground is cursed. Now you're going to have to deal with the thorns and thistles. Now it's not going to be quite easy. Now you've got to be toiling and sweating by the brow of your face in order to feed yourself. It's not all going to be so uh, nicely provided with a mist coming up and watering all the plants and, and really uh, uh, limiting the amount of work you even have to do to provide. Now it's different. Now there's weeds they came up as a result of sin to make the job harder and man don't you hate those weeds you got a, you got a garden you've got a lawn you got whatever it is you're trying to do and those weeds just pop up there and they get in the way and they, and, and they start overtaking and ruining what you're trying to do that's a result of sin it is so when everything that God made was good until man screwed it up, that's the way it was. So you can't just look at all of creation and be like, well, if God made it, then it must be good for me to eat or smoke. False. Genesis 9 even kind of says the same thing. It says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. This is after the flood. 
even as the green herb have I given you all things. So see how many times the Bible talks about the green herb, the green herb, the green herb. It's got to be talking about marijuana. No. No. What about, I mean, if, if that's the way you view this, if you think that, well, just because God made this plant, then it's okay to eat, it's okay to smoke, it's okay. What about hemlock? Anyone familiar with hemlock? You know what hemlock is? It's another poisonous plant. Go try eating some hemlock and tell me, well, God made it. It's good, right? I mean, I should just be able to eat this. No, you use some sense. Use some common sense. God, yeah, did God give plants for us to eat? Yes. Did he give animals for us to eat? Yes. But you know what? You still shouldn't be going around trying to eat a puffer fish. <laughs> right? And it's kind of a fool's errand to try to chop it up just right so you don't kill yourself trying to eat it. How about you just leave it alone? I don't understand that. There's a fish. And if you don't know, it's, 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 I think it's more popular in Japan, but like you can, you can, if it's prepared just right, and from what I read about it, the, the, the chefs have to go through like three years of training. Three years of training to know how to cut up this fish because if you screw it up, you can kill people. Why mess with it? Like, okay, I, I'm just, that's not a risk I want to take. It can't taste that good, <laughs> Whatever. the meat that's not tainted with poison, right? I mean, come on, fish doesn't really taste that much different. You got your tuna, you got your salmon, and you got your white fish. And that's about it. You, fish aficionados are out there going like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> come on, it's not, it's not that much. So. God made it, yes, but it's not just good for everything. And you can't just be like, oh, well, you know, God, God made grapes too. But he didn't intend on people getting drunk. It's listed off as a sin. Well, God made the, the marijuana plant too, but he didn't intend on you smoking it and getting high. You have to read that into scripture just to try to justify your sin, which is what people do with, with drinking. It's just the same thing. People want to use Genesis and say, see, look, God made the herb and the herb bearing seed and all this other. That must be talking about. It's the same people that said, well, Jesus turned water into wine. So it's okay for me to drink alcohol. Like, no, there's plenty of other evidence against that. So I covered that this morning. I'm not going to do that again. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. One of the worst arguments for being able to justify doing drugs is, well, I mean, what's the big deal? It feels good. I like the way it feels. And some drugs, some people might say, well, there really isn't any negative side effects. Now, depending on which drug we're looking at, the side effects are very easy to point out, but some of them are a little bit more difficult because there hasn't been a lot of research, especially in the hallucinogenic drugs, on the long-term effects of these drugs. So if you look it up and be like, well, I mean, there isn't anything really there. It doesn't mean there's no harmful effects. It just means there's enough study hasn't been done to, to rule it out. And before I even get into this in 1 Corinthians 6, Specifically on those types of drugs, remember this morning when I brought up the serotonin and the dopamine? You won't believe this, but these drugs also affect the same chemicals, the same brain activity. The LSD, the psilocybin, the DMT, all these different hallucinogenic type of drugs all all have an impact on the serotonin in your brain. And you know what else has an impact on the serotonin in your brain? If you're not familiar as much with those drugs, maybe you've heard of them, you know what they do, but antidepressants also affect the same thing because the amount of serotonin in your brain is gonna make you feel a certain way, it's gonna make your mood feel a certain way. So the less serotonin you have, the, the worse of a mood you might feel in, and the more you have, the better of a mood you're going to feel at, uh, um, about. I did, a, I did a paper on this back in high school about Prozac. That was the popular antidepressant of the time. And Prozac contains 
serotonin reuptake inhibitors, okay? The words don't, I mean, they mean something, but don't worry about understanding every single aspect of the word. All it means is that the reuptake of the serotonin in your brain is, is like the serotonin being consumed so that there's not as much of it in your brain. And the drug inhibits the reuptake, which means it allows for more of the serotonin to be present. Okay, that's all it means. It's, it's a complicated way of just saying that. It allows for more serotonin, which then impacts your mood. And it's an antidepressant because the more serotonin, the more you're just going to feel good. And these drugs, the dopamine and the serotonin, are going to also help to give you a, a euphoric type of a feeling, these good feelings and whatever, based on the chemical activity in your brain. But I'll tell you what, just like when you deal with people who are taking illicit drugs that are also impacting the same areas of your brain, you're going to be dealing with a lot of foolishness. Just as you do when you're talking to someone who's drunk, it's a lot of foolishness. And a lot of times, people who drink never realized how dumb the conversations are until you stop drinking and then you're around other people who are drinking and you'll be like, wow. I never would have thought that this was a dumb conversation until you kind of stay sober and you're like, the fools. It's the same thing with the drugs. Like I was just saying, with, whether it be the marijuana or even, you know, the LSD, oh man, I'm seeing things. And here's the draw for this stuff. And this is where it gets promoted, especially in the rock music. And that was a big influence for me when I was a kid, the classic rock, all these, these rock and roll bands doing the drugs and singing about the drugs. And it's so cool, man. And you want to expand your mind and you want to see things, and you want to know things, and you want to understand things that you couldn't normally do it. You take this drug, you're going to see this stuff. This is how they pitch it to you. This is how they sell it to you. But what, it, what it's doing, you can easily see and track uh, in the brain the chemical reaction going on. There is no extra understanding to it. And if it's doing anything at all, I would say this, it's just opening you up to more devils and demons. Because if you're actually seeing people, it's either a total figment of your imagination or you're seeing some, de some devils. And, and this, is, this is where it gets pretty scary, actually. And, and you know, kids, especially, you ought to be scared to death to do something like this. And especially those, those uh, the, the hallucinogenic drugs. Because you take that. You are no longer in control of what's going to happen in your brain. You have no idea what's going to happen. Oh, the, the sky is melting and you see, I just want to see these cool things. Yeah, but you don't know what's going to happen. I was around a guy in college who was taking some of this stuff and he was talking to somebody, having a conversation to someone that wasn't there in his closet. And that thing didn't like me. And he was telling me this. And he was having a conversation trying to tell this other creature that he was talking to that I was actually okay and I wasn't a bad person. That, that thing was telling him how bad I was. It, it's, it's weird. Okay, now look. Could be a total figment of imagination with these chemicals going on in the brain. Or maybe not. Either way, that's not something you ought to be messing with. And people do, people do all kinds of dumb things when they go on these trips because you get out of control. And I don't like, of all the things I don't like to admit, and I hate, I hate this, I really do hate this about myself because I'd rather be looked at as someone who could be a role model as opposed to someone who's done a bunch of bad things in his life. But the one instance that I, that I will submit of taking a substance that should never have been taken and the moment I realized I should never do it again was the moment that I was sitting in my apartment and I looked out at my balcony it was on a, a second story and the thought crossed in my head going wow I wonder what it would be like if I jumped off the balcony and it was a legitimate thought it was 
just as much of a thought as, hey, why don't we go down to the store and, and get some snacks? Hey, what would it be like if I just jumped off this balcony right here? And it was high up. I mean, it was the second floor, but it was, it was a weird shape, and it, it you know, kind of went down at the bottom. Next step would be just doing it. And people on these drugs do things like that. Because you end up being not so much in control when you take this stuff. Okay, that scared me significantly when I kind of came to my senses a little bit going like, whoa. Oh, hold on a second. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to have these crazy thoughts that, that it might seem okay in any world to jump off a balcony for no reason whatsoever, okay? I'm not proud of that at all, but look, it, it's real, and these are the types of things that happen. I have a family member who's much older than I am. When he was in college, because he was in college in maybe the 70s, he took some acid, got a bad hit, Got a bad dose, and to this day, he's been screwed up ever since. He's like an adult child. His parents have had to take care of him his entire life. He never came back to his senses. So you think it's cool. You think it's fun. Oh, these rock stars are doing it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I'm just going to expand my mind a little bit. Yeah, you don't know what you're taking, especially with these synthetic drugs. You have no idea what you're taking. And, you know, people who love money and just want to sell drugs don't care about you at all. They care about their money. And if something's a little bit different, if something didn't get cooked right, if something got some added substance to it, they don't care about you. They didn't care about him. And, and he's, like, mentally, like, retarded, literally. Literally. I'm not saying it's a joke, like, like he, he's, his, his brain is not right. It, it got fried from drugs. And he's barely able to, to kind of live on his own, but he needs some supervision and, and needs assistance in dealing with any important life tasks. One time. One time at a party going and doing that. That's all it takes. But, but somehow you might want to just be like, oh, no, it's not that big of a deal. Where would the, where would the Bible condemn that? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. 6. And we're going to look at verse number 19. Now, in this context, this is talking about fornication. And this should definitely speak to the stupid argument, well, I like the way it feels. It feels good. Well, just because it feels good doesn't mean you should do it. Because fornication could feel good, too but it's wicked as hell. It's a sin. Amen. Verse number 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How does it glorify God when you're ingesting poisons and ingesting chemicals to have these trips and to see weird things and to get this state of euphoria and act like an idiot and say stupid things, how does that glorify God? How does that glorify God in your body, which belongs to God? You are not your own. You don't get to just say like, oh, I'm going to live for the flesh and I'm just going to enjoy all this stuff and I'm just going to do whatever feels good. God owns you. Amen. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, the Holy Ghost lives inside of you. How dare you bring that poison and those substance into that temple? And, and on top of all of that, maybe even seeing spirits and devils. And communicating with them. That is very close to the witchcraft and the sorcery. The drug use, and especially psychedelic drugs, have been used in the past in all manner of heathen religions. The voodoo religions. People use the drugs. You've got your shaman. And your spiritual healer and guide. It's all pagan heathen religion 
that worships devils. It's not cool. Yeah, the doors try to make it cool. Oh, I'm a shaman. Ah, let's get high. Let's take a trip. It's not cool. Don't, and, and the parents, don't allow your kids to listen to that garbage because that's going to entice them to want to get into the sin. I, I wish that my parents would have withheld that stuff from me. But look, they, it wasn't a saved house. They didn't know any better. They were ignorant. It's stuff that they knew. Oh, yeah, okay, I know what that is. Yeah, and it's wicked. It's bad. It, it puts that stupid thought of the, the curiosity in your mind. Turn, if you would, to, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. It's a very simplistic argument, too, when you're looking at something that may or may not be spelled out explicitly in the scriptures. What is the fruit of it? What is the character, the spirit of it? When it comes to drugs, who are the people doing it? What types of, of circumstances and surroundings go hand in hand with this? What is the general life of people who are involved with this stuff? That alone should give you a really good indication whether or not it's of God or not, whether it's something that a Christian should be doing or not. Just in general terms, without getting the chapter and verse of every single thing, just kind of looking at it as a whole, as a picture, just being like, huh. People, Because people who do the drugs... They're usually not just doing one thing, right? It goes hand in hand with alcohol and a whole host of other drugs. And, you know, I started preaching on alcohol this morning because for almost everybody, that's where it starts, by the way. All of these other drugs, all of these other things, the vast majority of the time, it may not be 100%, the vast majority of the time are coming as a result of I tried the alcohol I like the way that feels. Now I want to know how this makes me feel. I like the buzz. I like the drunkenness. Let's see what this does. Let's see what this does. And then they move on to marijuana because that seems to be the safest bet. And then, oh, that was kind of cool, but now let me try this. And now let me try this. And this is the way it works with people. And the more you have this, this mind of wanting to try things, so many times people will put up these boundaries and say, well, I'll never do that. And then they do that. They say, well, I'll never do that. And then they do that. And I'll never do that, right? It starts off with alcohol. Oh, I'm just going to drink some alcohol. I'm not going to do any drugs. And then you lose some inhibitions, and then someone brings marijuana around, and you're like, well, I'll try that. Right? You've already become more stupid from the alcohol, so you figure, why not? Right? They're all doing it. It's not that big of a deal. It's legal in some states. Who cares? And then you try that, and you're like, oh, that was kind of cool. And then you're like, well, that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to do anything else. I mean, I would never do, like, cocaine or something. I'll give it a little bit of time, keep doing it, and then someone brings out the cocaine. Oh, okay, maybe I'll try once. And then you do that. Then you used to end up doing things you never would do before, and you're crossing lines you never thought you would do. I've never put a needle in my arm. Look, people don't start off with the needle. I don't think anybody does. I've never heard of it before. I've never heard of a person who's never drunk, Never smoked pot, never did any other drugs, and it's like, all right, let's get the heroin out, buddy. It doesn't happen. It's not the way it works, so you, you need to not get started in any of it. Maybe turn to Ephesians chapter 5. There's a few passages we're going to look at here, and, and I preached on this recently about being, walking as a child of light, Right? And I just noticed that in preparation for this sermon, every one of these passages also has a reference to being drunk and, and being in excess and having this, 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 this uh, contrast of walking in the spirit versus not being intoxicated. So let's read through this. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its saints. It's not your place as a, a child of God, as a saint, as someone who's sanctified in the blood of Jesus Christ, 
be going around and putting poison and putting drugs and putting these chemicals into your body that make you say and do stupid things. That is not for you to do. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Anyone trying to promote drugs, it's vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And the people who do the drugs, I mean, just, just again, from the real basic scenario, the drinking, the drugs, it's all things that are done at night. They're done in the party scenes. They're done at the raves or wherever now. I don't even know what, you know, but it's still being done at night. Whatever you call them, the gatherings, whatever, whatever it is. Like the vast majority, you think about, they're being done at night. You're a child of light. You shouldn't be out in the darkness doing the things of the darkness. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. People who are into doing drugs are fools. Fools. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. It's not God's will to be going on some trips, some psychedelic trips. <coughs> and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You don't need excess of dopamine or serotonin either. You don't need excess of alcohol. You don't need excess of these other chemicals in your brains. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll read for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 4 is where you're going. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 5, the Bible says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Amen. Sober. Watch and be sober. That is not a word that is only applicable to alcohol. Because people who are high on drugs are not sober. The word has meaning. Yes, it applies to alcohol because people who are drunk aren't sober. But people who are high in drugs are also not sober. And what is the will of the Lord? That you be sober, that you watch, that you're vigilant, that you're paying attention, that you're aware of your surroundings, that you know what's going on. Don't allow yourself to get in some condition where you're not sober. You will fall. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. And getting high is just a lust of your flesh. That's all it is. Just like drunkenness, you just want to fulfill this lust in your flesh. Don't spend your time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness. And this is talking about, look, how we were in the past. Before we were sanctified, before we became believers, before we wanted to serve God, before all these things. In times past, yeah, we were like the bringing, the bringing in the will of the Gentiles, of the unbelievers. We walked in lasciviousness, lusts 
excess of wine. That's how the world operates. The world does these things. That's not for us. The revelings, the banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. You will give account for yourself. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Look at verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The Bible commands over and over again to be sober. It doesn't matter whether or not God made the plant. If the plant makes you to not be sober, then you don't partake of the plant. Stay sober. Or the pill, for that matter. And I don't care if a doctor prescribes it to you and it makes you not sober, then you ought not to be taking those pills that make you not sober. And there's plenty of psychoactive narcotics out there that do that very thing that also impact the dopamine and the serotonin in your brain. So look into what the doctor prescribes you before you take it so you don't end up ingesting things that are going to make you not sober. There are ways of treating pain that do not have to have that same impact on your brain to make you no longer sober. Now, are there extreme situations where you might have to have a leg or an arm amputated or something and, and it's going to make sense to, to have a, a stronger pain? Yes. But that is not what we strive for and definitely not, you know, the, it should be the farthest thing from a recreational use. I'm not going to condemn somebody if you've got to have like an organ removed from your, from your body and you end up having some pain medication that's going to like help you to get rest and heal. But th this is where we need to use a common sense. Right? I mean, seriously. Just like the instance where the people who, who sent the spies away another way, like Rahab the harlot, she lied, but she saved life. So it's not like, well, I guess it's just okay to lie then. No, like, like there's a situation where God's gonna, gonna allow this and, and, and show respect to someone who's saving someone alive and they'll get credit for doing so, but it's still not right to, to tell the lie. It's not right to, to alter your mind, but in these extreme situation, it's not like it's, it's, it's not the same thing. You look at the greater good. If it's going to save the life of someone to be able to, to get the healing, then that's what you do. It's just like also if it's required of, of, a, of a man, a married man, to have to look on the nakedness of someone else in order to save their life. Like, look, we're not saying that it's okay to just do that and put yourself in that situation in general. But if that's like a life or death situation, then you just do it, right? Because you're saving the life. You're not going to be like, nope, can't see that. Now, obviously, those are rare situations, right? I mean, it's not an everyday thing. It's not something that should be popping up very often at all. First Peter, look at chapter 5. And if this doesn't sink in, I, I don't know what will. Verse number 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. When you're high, you aren't sober and you're not vigilant. Be sober, be vigilant. Why should I, do I have to always be sober, God? Why do I have to, to be paying attention and be vigilant? Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil doesn't care about you at all. In fact, he hates you and he wants you dead. He wants to devour you, he wants to destroy you. And when you're high on drugs, that is going to be prime pickings for the devil to attack you and get you in trouble and tarnish your name and smear your character and get you in a whole world of trouble and entice you with other lusts of the flesh 
because you've already now you're not being very vigilant because you're not sober you've opened up the door to all kinds of other things and when you open the door to sin you start I don't care what the sin you start open up the door to sin it's that much easier to do the next sin and especially when it comes to a sin that's going to alter your mind and lower your inhibitions and make you more open to just doing things in general that feel good. It's a lot easier when you open up the door to smoke and pot to get into gluttony. People get, I brought, I made a mention to it earlier, the munchies, you know, people get, they feel hungry. This is why they try to use the marijuana to treat cancer patients or people who have a problem from other medications that cause them to not be hungry because that's one of the things that this drug does is it makes people feel hungry even when they're not. And look, we can laugh about it, we can make jokes about it, but it's one of the things the drug does. And if you're not eating for strength, then you shouldn't be eating. You shouldn't just be living to indulge yourself and, and, and have, a, I mean, that's, that's what the Bible teaches too. It does, it's not taught very commonly because too many people are guilty of it, but we shouldn't be like the Bible says, eating for drunkenness. Satan's out there like a roaring lion looking who he wants to devour. And when he finds someone who's not vigilant and who's not sober, watch out. You can't afford, as a Christian, to not be in your right mind. You can't afford it. It's too, it's too much to lose. It's too much to risk. Especially a Christian that cares about, that loves Jesus and loves God. You're thankful for your salvation. You, you care about the gift of, of, of eternal life. And you want to be able to share that gift with as many people as possible and have a positive impact and serve others and do the work of, of Christ. You want to do all that stuff? Well, this, the exact opposite thing that you should do, the worst thing you do then, or one of the worst things is just get involved in this other sins and these drugs and, and not being in your right mind. Because that is going to destroy your testimony. It's going to destroy your work. One argument I've heard is the one that says, well, there's no physical negative consequences. And though, again, more towards the, some of the psychotropic drugs. Well, first of all, that's not established. And I would say that's not true. Because you may not know what you're taking. Those are all synthetic drugs. And you're buying stuff from someone else, you don't know what you're taking. Also, you're being partaker with other men's evil deeds. You're supporting someone that's, that's making their money, you know, making money selling drugs. Uh, do you really want to be someone who's a partaker with their evil deeds and whatever else they're doing? Well, I'm only buying this from them. Yeah, but they're probably selling a bunch of other stuff too. I mean, this goes on and on. And then as a believer, you know, we're supposed to be blameless. Well, these drugs are illegal. Now you're risking, you know, going to jail or getting, getting arrested and getting these, these crimes brought against you. Why? Just to indulge your flesh. At the end of the day, that's all you're doing. So you want to you wanna comment about how, well, there's no physical negative consequences. Yeah, but there's lots of negative consequences from doing drugs. And it's not even just about you anyways. Drugs are all about you. Doing drugs is like the most selfish thing in the world. People who do drugs and get drunk is the most selfish thing, self-centered, not caring about anyone else thing that you can do. Literally. People are so wrapped up in themselves and as the people who want to solve their problem, oh, I have all these problems, woe is me, and I'm going to take all these drugs and make myself not feel it. All you're doing is just being self-centered and thinking about yourself. How could you be thinking about someone else if you're allowing yourself to be in a state of mind that's not going to be conducive to actually being able to help other people because you're high, because you're on a trip, because you're doing whatever the drug is, methamphetamine, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. They all impact your ability to think, the ability to, to reason, the ability to make decisions. What about 
the family? What about the, the mom or the dad that has a child? I mean, shame on you if you ever let yourself be in a position to not be able to care for your child, whether it be booze, whether it be drugs. I mean, I couldn't, that, would, that would scare me to death. It does scare me to death that there are kids out there that have parents that for their own pleasure, they're willing to put themselves in some messed up state of mind. How do you know if your child isn't going to go and, and do something, get injured, or put themselves in a position where they could easily get injured, and now you can't deal with it all because you're just stoned out of your mind? I mean, it could literally cause the death of a child because you wanted to indulge and just satisfy and gratify the lust of your flesh. And people do that when they get drunk. Oh, I need to take my, my son to the, to the ER. Oh, but I can't because I'm inebriated. I can't even walk straight, let alone drive. It's so selfish. So selfish. And what if you don't have any kids? You say, well, what about some other loved one? Someone call, you go ahead and you get high and you take that drug and then someone calls you. He's like, man, I need you right now. Can you come and help me out? Uh, no, because I just care about myself. I'm not in a position to help you because I just decided to, to, to get high. You don't know when people are going to need you. And look, as someone who's supposed to be a servant and a minister and caring about other people, we ought to be making ourselves available as much as possible, right? And definitely not doing these things are going to prohibit us from being able to do the will of God. I mean, there's so many ways in which this is applicable and so many ways where you should never be in that situation and in that condition where you are just incapacitated. I'll read for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel uh, 13. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 says, despise not prophesyings. So, hey, selfish person that just wants to indulge in your flesh, don't despise the, the, the preaching of God's word. Let it sink in. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. No one has been able to convince me about what is good about taking any manner of drug these, you know, whether it be crystal, whether it be cocaine, whatever, man, you, you try to show me something that's good and, or any of the psychotropic drugs. Nothing. Abstain from all appearance of evil. How about that one as a believer? Well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Well, you know what? Like everybody else does. Even our culture, even our wicked culture today still is going to view the drug use as evil. How about you stay away from the appearance of evil? I mean, if nothing else, I, I mean, it'd be hard pressed to think that you can't see the problems with the drugs, but if nothing else, how about you just refrain from the appearance of evil? And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, you're not in control when you're high, and you're also putting yourself at risk for, for harm to even come upon you. I brought up the instances where you might have to be relied on for somebody else. Well, what about even just watching out for yourself and being aware of what's going on? When there is the plan against Amnon by Absalom, this is the last verse we're going to look at, verse number 28 in 2 Samuel chapter 13. He planned for it to be at a time when Amnon had been drinking at his house, invite him over, hey, look at verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. Watch out for him now when he's indulging and he's had enough. Pay attention to him because when he's merry with wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. He's setting him up. Hey, we're going to get him at his most vulnerable state when he's been just indulging and he thinks everything's safe. He's at my house. He thinks everything's good. 
that's when you go in and kill them. And that's like your adversary, the devil. You don't want to put yourself in that condition ever to be abused, to be killed, for evil to come against you, whatever the case may be. I think one of the reasons I haven't really preached on this much is because to me it's just like, it should just be common sense. Even before I got saved, I knew that this stuff wasn't good. Like, it's just common sense that drugs are bad. There's nothing good about it. The only good is when people see is because, well, I just want to feel a certain way and I want to gratify some fleshly lust. That's all anyone ever gets out of that. But for the believer, for the Christian, it's, it should just be common sense. We aren't supposed to be living to our flesh. We're not supposed to be gratifying the lusts of our flesh. No matter what that lust is, you don't just give in to that lust. It's not of God. God gave us enough good things in this life to enjoy. Good, wholesome, godly things that aren't going to change the way that you think and lower inhibitions and just give you this artificial euphoria. If you want to feel good, go serve other people. Go win a soul to Christ. That will give you a good feeling that's way better than any drug. Okay, and coming from someone who unfortunately has had some experience with this, none of it's cracked up to what people want to make you think it is at all, not even close. It all pales in comparison to leading someone to Christ. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm not just saying, oh, you're just a pastor. Oh, you're just trying to sound righteous. Look, I mean that with all of my being. It is a much, much, much better feeling that you get when someone calls on the name of the Lord, you've invested your time and you've shown them the gospel and they do that in front of you. Man, nothing compares to that. That feels good. And, and any of this chemical-induced feelings, they all come with a price, by the way. They all come with a price. And I didn't even get into the bondage that these drugs will bring because so many of them are addictive. And if they're not addictive physically, they're going to be addicted, addictive mentally. People say, oh, well, marijuana is not physically addictive. Yeah, but it's very mentally addictive. I, I mean, for all I know, I've got friends I went to high school with that probably are still smoking pot to this day. Pathetic. Pathetic. Decades. And they wouldn't think about stopping. I mean, I don't know. I don't talk to them anymore. It's not my crowd. I, I separate from, from the people who are going to live like that. It's nothing to do with me. I'm not going to uh, allow that to, to cleave to me. But it wouldn't surprise me one bit. There's so many people out there like that. And, you know, we ought not to be brought under bondage to any sin. I was going to have a turn to Romans 6. You could do that for homework and read Romans 6 yourself. And uh, talk about being under bondage to the flesh and to sin. We're freed from that. Let's walk as children of light. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. I pray that you please help us to be strong in our spirit. I pray that the children would especially learn, dear Lord, that uh, not to ever go down that path of, of the drugs and the alcohol. And, and Lord, I guess one more admonition that I never mentioned was when it comes to our flesh and being able to, to fight against our flesh, we, the, the more doors we open up, the harder the battle is going to be of having to resist those temptations in the future. And Lord, I pray that People here who have never gone down those paths will never go down those paths and be able to receive instruction without having to experience it for themselves so that they don't have to have that struggle for the rest of their life of, of having given their, their flesh a taste of some sin, but that they can be um, much less likely to want to indulge these particular sins because they've never given into it, dear Lord. And I pray you to please strengthen us in the spirit, help us to uh, walk uprightly, and walk as children of the day and not of the night. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.